both part are you mr montoya yes, sir. have both parties had a chance to review the psi report state yes your honor defense yes your honor any objections to the psi report state no your honor defense no your honor any witnesses state none from the state your honor defense yes your honor and who is your witness uh the first witness is serenity montoya do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth so help you god yes, all right if you can uh, lower your hand state your name for the record Serenity all right i'm going to need you to make sure you speak up so that the court reporter can hear all right uh defense all right uh serenity how old are you I'm 18 and are you working right now yes sir where uh, as a housekeeper and a laundry attendant. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what city do you live in? San Antonio, Texas. How do you know Michael Montoya? Michael Montoya is my brother. How old is he? 21. Right. And you know why we're here today, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And you've been in court with Michael through this process? Yes. Um, now, on the while the the incident happened, you weren't at the house, is that right? No, sir. Okay. But did you see Michael that day or the day prior? Yes. Um, describe how how he was. Mm -hmm. Michael was felt like everybody was out to get him. He never wanted to go nowhere. He just felt like everybody was up to hurt him. Um, did you, right before uh, this happened, uh, did you guys go get something to eat? Yes. Was we there did. Yeah. Earlier that day, before all this Mr. happened, Garham. I took Michael, me and Michael, I went to Panda Square. I remember we were there, or we going to order food, and we were about to get out. He like hesitated to get out. And um, I asked him the reason why he was hesitant to get out the car to go eat. Um, excuse me. Uh, that we we're talking to people, so then we're putting like telling them poison his food. I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. I mean, he thought we were associating with the workers, telling them like that we're poisoning to poison his food. I don't know. Okay, and just to be clear, were you doing that? No. Okay. I don't know. Right. Uh, oh, she can't hear. Okay, just try to, it's okay. Take a deep breath and then just um, try to enunciate mm -hmm. and you can speak slowly. Okay. Um, and, okay, just to be clear, you weren't doing that. No, sir. All right. Now, um, tell me about Michael growing up. He was a boy. I mean, like, he loves sports. Like, I don't know. Me and Mike, I do, like, he was my best friend. My brother, like, hard. Were you it's hard for me. It's mostly immensely hard for me. Like, I want to be here for my brother. It's hard for me to be up here on the road. Like, it takes a lot for me to do this. Like, like I know my better life is on the line. I don't know. It, how was he as a as a brother to you? An awesome brother. He was okay. he was there when I needed him. And would he look out for you? Yes. And, uh, I would even know. Well, he was always there. I don't know really had to call him up when he was there. He was. Since this has happened, I, I, since this has happened, um, you become aware of some of the, have you become aware of some of the mental health and, and drug issues that Michael was having? Yes. Were you, were you aware um, to that extent before? Fully aware, but I didn't know I was aware of some of his drug uses. But I was fully aware of every single one he did. Right. Uh, has he? Have you stayed in contact with him since he's been in jail? 
Um, has he expressed that he wants help? Yes, all the time. Every time he's always asking, like, what has me like talking with anybody for help, or like he wants people to come talk to him. I don't know. He wants help. Just me. He wants help. I don't know. <laughs> then so. Who do you live with right now? Back with myself, with my boyfriend. You and your boyfriend. Um, Lawrence. Yeah. Once Mike. Okay. Once Michael is released uh, now that you're aware of the, the extent of his issues uh, will you be there to support him yes uh, will you make sure um, that he he gets therapy and, and takes medication of course and do your best to make sure that he's not using any drugs yes um Brenda, is there anything else that you want this boy to know before she makes a decision on michael no When you like leave your seat, I was like, my brother would ask him, like, like he was like, my just showed like any leniency towards him. Like, he was asking him, like, I've seen like mentally, like, emotionally. I'm All right, so here's the, here's the issue the court reporter cannot hear what you're saying. So I understand that this is a rough time for everyone involved and that everyone is distraught. But if the court reporter cannot hear what you're saying, then she can't take it down, which means it's just like it didn't happen. Okay? I'm sorry, you're gonna have to talk louder. That wasn't him by heart. It's not something he was built. He doesn't mean it. He did. He doesn't show remorse for what he's done. All right. Thank, thank you. Any questions? No, you are. All right. Thank you for coming. Sorry. And what's who's your next witness? Michelle Hernandez. Michelle Hernandez. Michelle Hernandez. You raise your right hand for me. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth to help you, God? All right, you can lower your hand. If you'll state your name for the record and spell it, please. Michelle Hernandez, M I C H E L L E H E R N A N D E Z. All right, defense. Ms. Hernandez, how old are you? 41. Yeah, what do you do for work? Uh, contracting work with my husband. Okay. All right, so I'm going to need you to make sure you speak up so that the court reporter can hear. Yes, ma'am. Do you live here in San Antonio? Yes, sir. How do you know Michael? He's my son. Uh, obviously, you know why we're here today? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess around the, the time of, of this incident and when Michael was arrested, describe Michael's behavior. Um, very paranoid. Um, just didn't trust anybody. Uh, he was always to himself. On on that day, um, do you know if Michael had used drugs? Yes. Do you, if you know what did, what did he use? Um, marijuana and do you have a kidney? Um, during this time period, was there anything else uh, that? as far as michael's behavior that now maybe just for a moment counsel i can't help you all talking behind the court reporter here you need to move him down to the other end so you all can speak uh mr states and you all can speak in the box but it just needs to be on that end you may continue counsel thank you judge um looking back now that it may be red flags uh, about his behavior um, I don't know. Was he, did he ever, did you ever, did he or someone ever call the police about people oh, outside? Yeah, there was a couple of incidents when he thought there was a few, like 10 guys he said, so he's like, uh, we're outside trying to kill him when there was no one outside. He called the cops three night, three, three times in one night. And, you know, with, the, with those types of behaviors, do you, 
do you know, obviously, you know, Michael was using some drugs during that time. Yes. Um, now, describe Michael growing up as a child. Um, very athletic, uh, loving, caring, um, hard, he's a hard worker. Uh, did you have problems with him? No, none. Um, at the home, um, where is Michael's bi biological father? Um, I don't know. Okay. Did were there any issues with his biological father at the home? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, there was violence with him and I. Um, and did Michael witness some of that? Yes. Uh, did he witness alcohol abuse? Yes. Um, has he? Did he witness? People using drugs. Um, yes. Um, and would would you guys always be at the same house, or sometimes you'd have to go stay with his grandmother? Oh, whenever his father and I would, I, I'd take them to my mom's. Um, before this, was there any traumatic events? Uh, did he lose anyone that he was close to? His best friend. His best friend. Um, like four years, I believe, ago. And ever since then, I've seen a little, him go a little downhill. Okay. Uh, what about anyone in your family? Um, my brother, he was close to as well. How long ago was that? It was a year before that. Um, before uh, his best friend. And have you stayed in contact with Michael since he's been in jail? Every day. Um, Is there, is there anything else? Uh, or I guess, let me ask you this. You you brought with you a, a notebook here today, is that right? Yes. Okay, and in the, what's in the notebook? It's just pictures of Michael, a few of them that I have left over. I lost a lot of my things. And a pair of him growing up with other family members or friends. Uh, did we tender it to the court? With them? Uh, judge, judge. I've, I've viewed it. There's no judge. All right, the Thanks. court will review that, and I know how moms are about photographs, at least how my mom is. So I'm going to review it, and then I'll return it to you. Okay. That's but my next question, Drew. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, look through through the years. I guess uh, is this the same Michael during that time period? Even a few months prior, was that the same Michael that you knew growing up? Did you notice behavioral changes? Yes. Um, did you were you aware of his mental health and the extent of his drug abuse back then? No. Okay. Um, now that you are aware, do um, you think that he needs help? Yes. Um, has he expressed a desire to get help? Yes. Uh, has he expressed remorse about what's happened? Yes. Um, is there is there anything else that you want Judge Boyd to know before making her decision? Um, just thanks for listening. Mr. Brown, was that again? Sorry, she no, didn't take it. Thank you for listening. To no, um, thank you so much for coming in. And the prosecutor may have some questions okay. for you. I just have a few questions. Yes. Uh, one, did you know the victim in this case? Yes. Um, how was the victim? He was, uh, he's a good friend. A good, a good man? Yes. Okay. Didn't deserve what happened to him. Is that correct? No. Okay. And you're not aware of your son's drug use. Is that right? Um, the extent I'll, of it. That, that's what not the extent of it. No. Okay. So you used methamphetamine with him that same day? Okay. I'll move on to that next question. The fact is, is that your son even admits that he used on a daily basis that he lived with you. He used marijuana, he used meth, and he used Xanax on a daily basis. I didn't know how, I didn't know of him doing all of those. And you stated he had a good childhood. I saw the photos. Mm -hmm. And that he viewed some physical violence between you and your husband. Yes. And some physical violence between you and your boyfriend. Or boyfriend, uh, um, one of your boyfriends. Well, okay, yeah, maybe once. 
Maybe once. Maybe once. So not an extended period of time. Yes. Was he ever abused in the house? No. Sexually abused in the house? No. Was he ever sexually abused by anyone? No. Abused physically by anyone? No. Abused emotionally by anyone? I mean, I know. No. So the only time you saw the difference in his behavior is when he started using drugs on a daily basis since the day of 18 years old. No. You saw uh, behavior before that. that you no, didn't yet. I just seen the behavior change when his best friend and my brother passed away. How old was he? I believe he was uh, 16. 16. Mm -hmm. So he started using alcohol back in sixth grade. You're aware of that, aren't you? No. That's what he stated. No. So you're not aware of that. Where were you at during this time when he was in sixth grade and started using alcohol on daily, or at least- He was days? at my mother's house. At your mother's house, yeah. Where were you? I was not living with them there. Okay, no further questions, Your Honor. Any other questions? No, Your Honor. I do, a question wasn't asked wasn't answered were you using meth with your son that's either yes or no yes all right thank you any other questions no, 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 all right defense call your next witness all right if you could state your name for the record Rick Phillip Charles Jr. all right defense thank you Mr. Charles uh, how old are you 40 years old and do you work yes um what do you do for work? I'm a subcontractor for uh, residential homes. All right. How do you know Michael? I know him from his mother. We've been very for four years. Okay. And so you've known Michael about four years? Yes. All right. Um, you know why we're here today? Yes. And you were actually uh, there when the incident happened. Correct. Um, and I think the, the prosecutor asked, so I'll ask you, I mean, it, was there... You weren't being attacked or anything. There was a no. To your knowledge, there was no reason for, for Michael to do that. No. Um, around that time period, um, either that day or even a few days prior, uh, did you notice any any behavior issues or red flags about Michael? He he became distant from me and his mother. He would leave with his. <clears throat> sister and the boyfriend then he'll come back and tell us like they're acting weird as if they were planning something plotting something against him and then whenever he would leave his family vice versa he would tell them about us plotting something against him he just thought everybody was against him he was very unsecure with everything even kind of expressed he thought we were with them to poison their food and was that the incident that serenity was talking right. about yes, um, that was the same day that's what i thought okay um i mean when when he wasn't like that though what type of person was michael he was michael he was great he was loving caring asking everybody for help or if they need help asking me he went on several jobs at least over 10 jobs with me working so so the michael that that day where the incident happened was that the the michael that you had seen or was that did that shock you it's not michael working himself that day that day he he wanted to leave that day and i, I talked to him to stay and i'll give him a schedule throughout the following week and we got the back to work and we were real bonded that day. He, um, he always distanced himself from me as if I was against him or if I didn't like him. And then I'll talk to him and he'll realize like I'm here for him, I'm here for the family. I, I love my brother. He's like my child. He's my... Is there anything else that you want Judge Floyd to know about Michael before she makes a decision? That, that thing. Michael wasn't himself. I hear him on the phone now, and that's Michael. I'm very kind hearted and always looking out for others. And that, that day when the incident happened, he made a comment to me saying, You didn't tell me to do it. You didn't. And from that moment, like, I, I was upset with him, thinking that. 
what what made you think of tell anything like that that's with my friend who's was just I was so confused I was lost I got a started yelling at him like at that at the scene I don't know. I was just I was very upset and lost with peace and I, just, I didn't know what was going to do mine and me and his mother been trying to figure that out this past year and, and that's his help. He needs help. Thank you. Um, the prosecutor may have some questions for you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Ron. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Charles, uh, just to, I just want to clarify. Mm -hmm. You knew the victim. I know you worked on other jobs for you or yes, worked sir. with you. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And so, no, sorry. And uh, the fact is, is that that particular day, he, he was not threatening to you. He didn't uh, try to hit you that you saw. He didn't try to attack the uh, the, the defendant in this case, Mr. Uh, Michael Montoya. No. Prior to that, Mayor. Yes. Prior to that, they were outside. But the twenty minutes prior to that incident, they were outside talking, and then I, I try to butt in their conversation as as the both Michael's family called my friend, and they were just ignoring me because they're having a good time. They they were they were laughing. And I just forget y'all and I walked inside. And in fact, in, in these ring cameras, you're aware of the ring camera videos that were supplied by the homeowner. Uh, in this case, yes, yes, you can see the three of y'all standing out there, and there was a at least a cigarette or something smoking that was passed around. Is that right? That is correct. And what was that? That was a blunt. A what? A blunt. A what? marijuana blunt. Okay, so marijuana. Yes. And so prior to that, nothing had happened. Nothing had transpired between the defendant and the victim. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And when y'all went into the house. You left the house, and then the defendant, Michael Montoya, shot, well, shot at the victim three different times. Are you aware of that? That is, that is incorrect. That's incorrect? I was in the same room when Michael shot. Paul. So were you watching it happen? Negative. No, sir. So you were turned around? I was kneeled down into a power cabin. Okay. So you were there when it happened? Yes. And what happened after that, after he was shot? I couldn't get up at that very moment. When I was able to actually stand up, I turn around, I see like a tunnel vision. Michael on the other side of the doorway, I never saw Paul. And I saw Michael with the, with the handgun, not facing at me or you just had it tilted downwards. Mm -hmm. Like if you didn't know. He didn't have no response to what he did at that moment. And I was, I was terrified. I thought, I didn't know what was going through his head when he started hearing, Michael, 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 what did you do? Michael. And he snapped out of it and then he realized what he, like, he had the gun in his hand. And, what, what do I do? What do I do? Doc? What do I do? I said, put, put the gun down. And then it was a five gallon bucket. He put it down and he put it down and that's when I, charged him and I saw Paul on the side of the doorway folded up. Okay. Yes. And then and then you you're the one that called the police, is that correct? His mother. His mother called the police. Okay. And then you waited for the police there, is that correct? We both did. Okay. Well, but Michael did. Michael did. Okay. And came back. I'm sorry. But but came back. Right. Are you you're aware of his drug use still? Uh Yes, yes. I mean, that night you, you smoked marijuana. One yes, day. I did smoke marijuana. Are you aware of his other illicit drugs like Xanax? Um, I'm aware. We tried not to. Any type of other drug in that I didn't prove any of that. I didn't. Well, you're aware of the meth use, obviously. Yes, I'm aware of it. And you're aware of the marijuana, you're aware of alcohol use? The marijuana, um, I did smoke. Right. I'm not I'm no, not working on that, but you're aware that he 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 used it quite a bit. I don't know about quite a bit, but yes, he did use it. Too. Can you describe to the judge the demeanor of Michael when he was on meth? He 
use on meth or marijuana or sober, he was still the same in my perspective, but his thought process, if it was negative, it would be 10, like 10 times worse, or if it was positive, it would be 10 times as positive. It would just enhance his, of that, of the mood he was in. But what I'm trying to get to is the fact is you see a, a, a marked difference in his attitude now, right? When you talk with, on the telephone? Yes. So he's not on drugs now. Um, he's on anxiety. Well, but I'm sorry. He's not on that. Uh, no, no. Okay. No. And he's not doing smoking marijuana, right? Correct. Okay. So there's a difference between him being where he voluntarily goes out and does Xanax, that's not prescribed to him. When he does meth, that's not prescribed to him. When he does marijuana, when it's not prescribed to him. When he's out in the world doing all these drugs, he's a different type of person. Yes. And now he's a different person because he's not on all those drugs. He, that, that is true. He, we, none of us understood his medical condition that we believe that he has mm -hmm. now. And I, I'm no doctor with not, but I feel that he used that to help, help him cope. And, and I might, I myself, um, I, I've been, I've been incarcerated. And the reason I'm saying that is, but it took me, I understood about myself by getting help from, from the, the, the system, they, they put me into rehab and I understand a lot about myself from there and whatnot. I just believe it is myself. Thank you, no further questions, John. Nothing, nothing further. All right, thank you. thank you. Defense call your next witness. Dr. John Matthew Fabian, I believe he's present via Zoom. Yes. Any objection to Dr. Fabian testing, testifying by Zoom statement? No, you're on. All right, uh, Dr. Fabian, if you could unmute and show your video, please. Okay, hello, Judge. Hello, if you could raise your right hand for me, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I swear. All right, you can lower your hand, state your name for the record. Sure, uh, my name is John Matthew Fabian. Defense. Thank you, Judge. Um, and Judge, you have a copy of his report? Yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Fabian, uh, just what, what are you licensed in very briefly? Just briefly, uh, clinical psychologist. I'm licensed in about seven states. I'm board certified in forensic psychology, clinical psychology, and I'm fellowship trained in clinical neuropsychology. All right, and you performed an evaluation on Michael Montoya. I did, yes. Uh, and you, you performed different tests on him. I did. Um, and it, what did you use in your evaluation for your report? Uh, well, I saw him on October fourteenth, two thousand twenty-two, and December nineteenth, two thousand twenty-two. And I conducted both neuropsychological and psychological tests with Michael. Uh, and there, there are a number of them uh, in addition to, uh, you know, some of his, his history and as to why he did do testing of that nature. And I guess just to go kind of in order of your, um, your evaluation here, you go through background and family history. What stood out? Uh, in the background family history portion uh, that you think is relevant sure so your honor briefly um you know michael had you know come from a very dysfunctional background uh, there is uh domestic violence physical verbal uh between mother and father uh mom eventually left father and then you know she um connected with a boyfriend and um, there was then domestic violence uh, between boyfriend and mom. So he uh, witnessed quite a bit of uh, domestic violence and chaos growing up. Um, I would note that during my evaluations, he struggled with 
really expressing thoughts and feelings in part because just a poor verbal skills, poor language skills. Um, and really he's never dealt with any of these uh, tra trauma based issues. Uh, I would also highlight uh, more on page um, like three of my report that um, mom did have a history of, of substance use. And uh, there again was a lot of instability in the home. He moved around frequently um, to different family members. Uh, and, you know, there was, in my opinion, some evidence of, of neglect. Uh, the family was impoverished, very poor. Uh, his father had a history of incarceration, uh, chronic alcohol, methamphetamine problems. You know, he'd been in the Bear County Jail, in my understanding, multiple times. And then in addition to that, uh, you know, residential chaos, family chaos, instability, he reported being shot at um, when he was eight. 18. Uh, and then we turn into his developmental history and he perceived endorsed symptoms of ADHD. Uh, it's my understanding he was never properly assessed or treated for it. Um, he had difficulties academically with school, uh, with comprehension. Uh, although my understanding, he, he was never uh, formally placed in special education, uh, but he attended a number of different schools and that school instability um, was similar to residential and family instability. Um, should I keep going, Counselor? Uh, well, let me let me ask you about Counsel, the... just so you know, the court has read his entire report. Okay. I always read everything. OK, uh, then I'll, I'll try to, to ask specific, uh, more specific questions. And um, Dr. Fabian, you, you talk about physical and emotional abuse that he witnessed. You talked about drug and alcohol use that he witnessed at a young age. Now, how does that affect somebody, it, even if the, 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 that person themselves is not the person being physically abused? How does that affect someone at that age? Uh, well, it's not a good effect, obviously. Um, there there was chaos in the home, plus, you know, social learning, uh, modeling of substance use. You know, his mother had been using drugs in the home, it's my understanding. And then he eventually was using methamphetamine with her even the day of the offense. Uh, so, uh, you know, parental substance use genetically and environmentally places an offspring at risk to use and abuse substances as well. And, uh, you know, it was clear that he had been using in the home uh, methamphetamine uh, the day of the offense with family members. And so uh, you talked about modeling. So is that if you you see your parents doing that, that's something that you think maybe you should do or or you mimic that behavior later on? Yeah, so the research is clear that individuals that offspring are more likely to use and abuse substances if their parents, you know, do as well. And both parents uh, did struggle with methamphetamine use, the biological parents and um, the boyfriend that mom had as well. Now, um, because of those issues, I think you you diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, how, do, how does that affect somebody having PTSD? And would someone even know that they have that? Uh, well, no, not not in these particular circumstances. Typically, you know, individuals of you know low socioeconomic status, um, just a lack of education as to these issues, um, the family and the individual typically are not aware of that. Uh, and in this case, it's my understanding he had never been evaluated uh, by a mental health professional. And in my opinion, there was no insight by family or resources to do so. Uh, and I, I know that on page seven of my report, we look at more evidence of um, polytrauma with their, you know, uh, there's different types of abuse and neglect that he witnessed and or experienced and, um, <clears throat> you know, early in childhood. So he was never evaluated um, for uh, you know, PTSD and would not know that he had it. Uh, and then when I did examine him, uh, it was clear that he did have evidence of PTSD. And, and I think you mentioned before, it might be even more difficult since he had trouble expressing emotions and and feelings. Yeah, and that's due to not only the the not having done it before due to mental health issues of PTSD, uh, often avoidance, 
uh, of of dealing with those negative uh, trauma based thoughts, feelings, using substances to self medicate, but also, uh, in my opinion, he has a language based learning yeah. disability that was not diagnosed. And you said using substances to self medicate. So uh, it, you're aware of the extensive drug use and alcohol use by Mr. Montoya. How did how did that affect his behavior and? Sure. So I have diagnosed him, you know, with PTSD, ADHD combined type, and then language learning disorder. And then we have um, on page uh, 18 of my report, uh, methamphetamine, alcohol, cannabis, and Xanax use disorders. Uh, so there is clear evidence that you know, he had never been assessed, treated for mental health issues or conditions that he does have. And, you know, in my opinion, there was evidence that he was, uh, you know, self-medicating with the use of stimulants and then downs or downers, benzodiazepines um, and the other substances, you know, to essentially make him, you know, self feel better uh, and also treat in uh, uh, the psychiatric symptoms that he that he does have, and this eventually led to a methamphetamine induced psychosis with psychotic symptoms mimicking schizophrenia. It, and that was going to be my next question. So the prolonged use of drugs, and in this case methamphetamine, uh, how does that again? How does that affect someone's brain, their thinking, their reasoning? Sure. So. I mean, it simplistically methamphetamine is a psychostimulant and it's going to be affecting like many substances, the reward center of the brain, the limbic system. But in this, with this type of drug, it also affects, uh, the, I'd say the temporal lobes, which in part houses schizophrenia. Um, that's where that, uh, that disorder, psychiatric disorder, when it's present originates. And, um, it also has similar effects, um, at, with with neurotransmitters um, within the brain of schizophrenia. So in, in essence, um, in this case, his methamphetamine use manifested into psychosis. And and it was it's my belief and perception based on my evaluation that he was, uh, you know, substance induced, methamphetamine induced, intoxicated um, and psychotic at the time of this offense. And with um, with therapy and, and maybe prescribed medication, and then obviously staying sober, um, are these things or behaviors that Mr. Montoya might be able to to change? Well, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, um, when I go to page tw uh, my last page of this report, or actually page twenty, Your Honor, um, I I look at this as a basically a try diagnosis. I, you know, a lot of times these individuals, these defendants I evaluate really have never had a look or an evaluation until it's forensically based in court. And in my opinion, he had neurodevelopmental disorders of ADHD and language disorder. I would say with mild brain dysfunction, he has evidence of PTSD and, you know, polytrauma. We call it complex trauma, very intense PTSD that was really never assessed or diagnosed and then chemical dependency problems and and they do um they they do you know they're, they're collective in combination certainly affects his life in a number of ways so you know I, he needs he needed this evaluation to figure out really what was going on with him and developmentally and currently and then as far as the treatment yes i mean he does need psychiatric medication management uh, for the ADHD and PTSD, trauma-based psychotherapy that's long-term, and chemical dependency treatment programming. And hopefully the effects of methamphetamine will not then develop into a full-blooded schizophrenia condition. And so to maybe sum it up, the undiagnosed mental health um, can lead to looking and the uh, modeling that you talked about from his his parents can lead to using drugs and alcohol to treat those conditions and then that prolonged use leads us to where we are today is that 
No question. And, and it is a biopsychosocial phenomenon. But I mean, he also lived in a very impoverished environment where there was drugs, alcohol, violence within the home and in the community. So yeah, he was at high risk to develop substance use problems. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fabian. I'll sure. pass the witness. Any questions? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Fabian, I'm Jason Gary, and a prosecutor for the state. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, I guess my question is, you evaluated him. Did he ever state at any time that he was forced to use methamphetamines? No, no, I, he, he was not forced. He was an adult as well. It's my understanding. So, I, you know, no one forced him. I mean, I think there was some influence if he's using substance of his parents or his mother, but no one forced him. Okay. And then also on the last line of your report, uh, line, uh, page 20, last line, it states that at a portion here, it said he had a break of contact from reality and was hallucinating and was uh, markedly paranoid at the time of the offense. Can you describe to the judge, what do you mean by hallucinating? Well, he had endorsed what he thought was um, auditory hallucination. Uh, and as, as I say, I think on page 18, it says, I just remember Edward telling me what to do. And um, in my estimation, there was evidence of paranoia and auditory hallucinations, but they were substance induced based on methamphetamine. And you're saying this was substance uh, induced psychosis. Uh, by methamphetamine. Yes, it's my understanding that he had used about a month straight um, and, you know, binge use and use the same day. So I cannot say that this was uh, separated or differentiated from any type of schizophrenic uh, condition. I would have to say it was uh, methamphetamine induced psychosis. Uh, I mean, you're not saying that he is schizophrenic uh, had this since he was a child or anything like that because his mother testified just earlier that he had a, a, a good childhood and we saw several photos I know that you're not privy to these photos uh, of his childhood and and his support system uh no I'm not <laughs> I'm, I'm you know I, I'm sure he had happy moments in childhood I do uh, question the consistency of that um, but okay. no further questions John Nothing further. All right. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. Any other witnesses to this? No, Your Honor. State, any witnesses? No witnesses, Your Honor. All right. Any arguments? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Brief argument? Yes, Your Honor. I'll, I'll make it brief. The court, the court's aware we provided the, the report for Dr. Fabian. Uh, look, he, Mr. Montoya, Michael is a 21 year old with very limited history um, of any, any crimes. Uh, he was a, a normal young person, and then things outside of his control at that time when he's younger uh, influenced him, and unfortunately influenced him in such a way um, that partly led us here today. And I don't say fully because he was an adult. He has to make those decisions. Um, but he witnessed physical abuse, verbal abuse. He witnessed alcohol use and extreme alcohol use. He witnessed drug and methamphetamine used from not from the not just friends we're talking about people that were supposed to model good behavior instead be a support system and instead like dr fabian said model behaviors which he mimicked later on um it if we look at his statement in the psi um now that he's been in custody he's had time to reflect we've gone over things um, he admits one of the statements he says to, to the detective, no, I, you know, that, that person didn't do anything to me. Um, it, again, we're not trying to say that it was self-defense or anything like that. He, he wanted to take full responsibility for what he did. Uh, and he's doing that here today. He continues to do that, but drugs, it, there's no question that the behaviors he witnessed in his childhood combined with the, the drug use affected his, his brain and his thinking, just like Dr. Fabian said. Um, and Dr. Fabian said, well, with therapy and prescribed medication, uh, continued treatment, and obviously staying sober, 
that he can try to, to change those behaviors and that way of thinking. And I think we've heard a little bit that it started going that way. Um, again, I, I think just the, the biggest thing is that he, from a young age, he has outside influences that were not even just neglect, but showing him the absolute wrong things to do at a young age and how that impacted and influenced him to create mental health problems that went undiagnosed, uh, that he, his parents never sought treatment for, that he never got treatment for until we were here today, until he was seen in the Bear County Jail. Um, there were some warnings from the, the continued methamphetamine use, and Michael's very honest with his drug and alcohol use um, because he knows he needs to be, not only for because we're in court, but because he wants and needs to get help and treatment at some point. Um, and he, I think he's talked about getting an education, finishing high school, um, continuing to try to seek treatment while he's in prison, because obviously that, that is where we know that he's going to go under this plea bargain agreement. Um, but again, I think just listening to Dr. Fabian and the, at a young age, it's easy to say, well, you were young and your sister's fine, so why can't you be fine? But that's not the way the world works. That's oh, I not, never do that. That's not, not I appreciate that. It's not the way everybody's brain works and, and develops. And so unfortunately, we're here today. He's very remorseful. He's very sorry for what he did. There's no getting around that. Uh, but we did want to bring the court um, some other things that were going on. We asked the court to take that into consideration um, and sentence Michael to 15 years. All right, state. Your, your Honor, uh, uh, the defendant, we saw the photos that were presented to the, the court. And I know that is a snapshot, literally a snapshot of his childhood. But yet there are photos of his childhood, of him growing up, that he had some type of support system through grandparents and other individuals in his life. But he chose, yes, at a young age, not to proceed and take advantage of those people. What he chose to do is drop out of school and cut class and drink alcohol, use marijuana, and things that were detrimental to his mental health, anybody's mental health for that matter. For, for the fact is, is even in Dr. Fabian's report, he didn't start using methamphetamines and Xanax to the age of 18 at the time that he was an adult. So that, that at that point, Your Honor, he's making adult decisions that were detrimental to himself, not because of PTSD, not because of ADHD, because he chose to take the easier way and he wanted to go have drinks. He wanted to go smoke marijuana. The day of, he smoked marijuana with his, his uh, mom's boyfriend. The day of, he just chose to do methamphetamine. That caused him to be voluntarily intoxicated, that he chose that path. So... The fact that defense is asking for a sentence of 15 years is is, is not appropriate in this, in this case. 35 years in this type of case is appropriate because this person chose to go down the path he chose. Granny, everybody has their childhood, everybody has their past. If you really look at what the, the doctor said and what his parents said, yes, there was some violence in the in, in the, uh, the household. There was substance abuse in the household. But there's many people sitting in this courtroom today that chose different paths. And some of them are, are, are on a rocky road. But the fact is they haven't murdered somebody and shot them in the head when that individual is just there to help them. And, and, and Mr. Butler was there to help. He was there helping and he was a plumber. And this is the victim in this case. And that's just a tragedy right there, is that this individual is out there helping late at night, trying to get this house renovated. And this individual decides to get intoxicated off of meth, Xanax, and drinking, and marijuana, and shoots him just blindly behind the head. And that right there, Your Honor, deserves a 35-year sentence. Thank you. All right. So, um, Mr. Montoya. I want you to know that I listen to everything that's brought before me and I consider all the evidence that's brought before me. I mean, do you deserve an apology? Yes. And you know why you deserve an apology? Because you had horrible parents in your life. 
your mom, horrible parent, still a horrible parent to this day, using meth with you. She was horrible for bringing someone into your life as a stepfather who just got out of prison using drugs and using drugs with you. So you have horrible parents, horrible adults in your life. Your grandmother, it appears that your grandmother was trying to help you stay clean and sober, but then you have your horrible mom coming in and allowing you to live with her and use meth with her. That is ridiculous for your horrible mom to be using meth with you and rubber stamping it and okaying it. And then having your horrible stepfather who thinks he's a good stepfather, but there he is using drugs with you. And I guarantee you right now, your mother doesn't think she's a horrible parent, even though she's using meth with you. Your stepfather thinks he's doing a great job, even though he's using drugs with you. So I want you to know that I understand and I heard everything. And I understand that you had a horrible upbringing. But by that same token, there's a complainant in this case, somebody who's dead, who had family who loved and cared about him. And he's just working, doing a job. This is not a situation where he was doing something illegal or doing something inappropriate. And whenever a life is taken, guess what? Society suffers because whatever they were bringing to this world, maybe for the benefit of others, we no longer have that. So when I sentence you today, I want you to know that I realized your childhood was horrible. And sometimes people have a childhood that's horrible and they make it out. And you wonder, how did they ever make it out? And then sometimes when children are taken from the hospital to be with their horrible parents, you know that they're going to have a horrible life. And you have had a horrible life with your horrible mother and your horrible stepfather. And I don't know what they're doing with your sister. I don't know if they're using meth with your sister or not. I don't know if there are gr uh, grandchildren that people are allowing your horrible mother and your horrible stepfather to be around. So I want you to know that I heard all of the testimony and I listened to it and I internalize it. Okay. So I'm going to find you guilty. I'm going to sentence you to 35 years in the prison, give you credit for any time served. There is an affirmative finding of deadly weapon. Court will take in consideration 665487 and 673117. I'll ask for the therapeutic community. And I'll also ask, they do have mental health treatment at the prison. I'll ask for that as well. I don't have any jurisdiction to force them to do that. But if you request it and they see that I'm requesting it, they may be able to do that for you, okay? Because this is a plea bargain agreement, because I followed your plea bargain agreement and because you waive your right to appeal, you do not have the court's permission to appeal. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. All right, uh, uh, we'll go off the record. I know that this seems like a lot of time, and honestly, it is a lot of time, but it's time for you to understand how you got to the position where you are, and it's also time for you to grow and get away from other people. I can't tell you or force you not to have any conversations with your mom, but your mom needs, means you no good. Because if she did, she wouldn't be using drugs with you. If she did, she would have told you, stay with your grandmother. I'm not a good parent because I'm using meth. She still thinks she's a good parent using meth and bringing a criminal in your life who's using drugs. Who on the outside comes in wearing a nice outfit, dressed appropriately for court, but he's still a drug user. And that's who she's bringing around you. The fact that she gave you a father who everybody said was not a good father, then what does she do? She brings boyfriend after boyfriend to be negative influences in your life. So whether or not you continue to have contact with her is completely up to you, but you need to work on yourself because otherwise when you get out of prison and at some point you'll get out of prison, you're gonna be right back where you started from. You understand? Yes, All right, good luck to you. Do we have victim impact? We do have victim impact. All right, is that, I don't see anyone on, is that Cassandra Castro? Yes, it is. Uh, Ms. Castro? Yes, I'm here. All right. Do you wish to show your video? All right. Uh, you may proceed, Ms. Castro. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just click to my, my thing. Hello, Michael. My name is Cassandra.
sorry. I am Paul's only child. He was my father. And I wasn't sure before today if the two of you actually knew each other or if you just saw him for the first time that night. But let me just tell you a little bit about him that you may not know. He was also a grandfather to my four children. He was a father-in-law to my husband. He was a son and he was a beloved and cherished brother. He was an uncle, a cousin and a friend to everyone who knew him. My dad was not perfect, but he was loved by so many. He was funny <laughs> and he was always ready to have fun. He was an artist, I don't know if you knew that. He liked to draw and he was a plumber by trade. He is so missed by everyone in our family. And not being able to talk to him is not an easy thing. When I heard how old you were, my heart was broken. Not just because of the loss of my father, the loss that our family has experienced not having him around, but also because of the loss that I'm sure your family must feel not to be able to have you around anymore. Your life, their lives, and my family's lives will be different because the decisions that you've chosen to make. When I heard that I could speak to you, I wasn't sure what I was going to say, so I prayed about it. And it's taken me a while to get to this place. It's taken me a while to get here, but I want you to know that I forgive you for taking my father's life. That wasn't an easy choice for me to make, but I want you to know that. And it's taken a lot of prayers and tears and countless nights with Jesus to get me there. I was supposed to write a statement about how my father's death has affected me and my family. But I don't see how that's going to help much. What's going to help me heal is Jesus. And he'll walk me through every stage of healing that I need. And that's between him and I. Instead, I want this impact statement to actually have an impact. And the person it would affect is you. So instead, I want to tell you what it is that I hope to get out of this letter. My hope for you, Michael. And I hope you listen right now. My hope for you is that you give your life to Jesus Christ. I pray that you change your story. Your actions do have consequences. And yes, the prison sentence is a long prison sentence. But your life doesn't have to be awful. A life with Jesus is hard, but it is always full of hope and joy and peace despite those hard times. And nobody may have told you that before. I don't know if anybody's ever told you about Jesus in your entire life, but I wanna tell you that now. And like I said, I wasn't really sure what to say to you besides everything I've said. And, and so I had prayed and I just asked God to speak to you through me. And I asked God what he wanted to say to you and to use me to deliver that message. So when I prayed, this is the message that I heard from God to you, Michael. So this is, these are God's words to you. He says, Michael, I love you so much. 
my love for you runs so deep, more than you could ever know. When you were a baby and a toddler, I saw you. I watched you grow. The plans that I had for your future were great, and they still are. More amazing than you could ever imagine. However, along the way, you've made your own choices that have hurt not only me, but yourself and the people around you. And you've chosen to live your life for yourself and do the things that you want to do. I love you, Michael. And I am devastated that you have chosen a life of sin over a relationship with me. When you know that something is wrong and you choose to do it anyways, that is a sin. And the sin that you have chosen will take you away from me forever. It will take you to hell. And hell is a real place. And it's the most awful place to ever exist. It's a million times worse than any prison. And I don't want anyone to ever go there. And if you die in your sin, it will be too late for you. And you will be in hell forever. The penalty, the, the consequences of sin is death. And it's a spiritual death. And all that means is that you and God were separated forever. I don't want that. I am a holy and perfect God. And I cannot be in close relationship with anyone who is living a life of sin. But everyone sins. So something had to be done. And in John 3, 16, in the Bible, it says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus Christ is my son, and I sent him to earth to die a horrible, gruesome death on a cross, just so that I can be with people forever in heaven. He paid the penalty. Jesus paid the price, and he took the consequences of the sins of the world as if those sins were his own. And he received a punishment for the sins of the world so that people wouldn't have to. Because Jesus was sinless, his sacrifice was perfect. His sacrifice paid the price. And now all you or anyone else has to do is put your faith in my son, Jesus. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and you are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That was everything that I have heard from God. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Thank you.